books, and you can have them signed. <laughs> uh, but I think, I think uh, getting something autographed is really kind of special. Um, there's a great essay by Jeanette Witterson, who's a British novelist. Uh, <laughs> and she has a book of, of, of essays, and it's called uh, Art Objects. And, and, you know, and it's Art Objects or Art Objects. Uh, <laughs> But she has a, a piece on autographs and uh, how the, the author touching, <laughs> they print three million of these. But if it's autographed, the author actually touched it. You got, there is a connection that didn't exist. So I, I sort of like that and I get everything autographed. Uh, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about how we end up with these three wonderful poets. Um, it's a totally blind process. Uh, people send us stuff. We make sure their names aren't anywhere on it. We have no references. It goes through a uh, submissions uh, committee where at least three people read every piece and you don't get to be the finalist unless two of the people like it. Uh, and then the last submissions go to our uh, final judge. Um, who this year is Grace Bauer, who's terrific. Uh, but the first year I had uh, Eleanor Wilner, who's a great poet and lives in Philadelphia. And she said, Larry, it, even though it was blind, I could recognize some people's style. You need someone who doesn't live in the city. <laughs> so, so we now make sure that the final judge is someone who doesn't live in the city. Uh, so um, what we're gonna do and what I really like, Grace had something to say about each, each of her selections, which I really like. And of course, I'm at that age where I can't see. And what I neglected to do was blow this up, because if it's three times larger, and I put on my reading glasses, sometimes I can sit. Okay, so what we're going to do is kind of reverse order. Um, so our first reader is going to be uh, Liz Chang, uh, the author of Animal Nocturne. Mm. Grace says, uh, this collection opens with a pro poem fittingly entitled, A Herd of Elephants is Sometimes Called a Memory. Other animals inhabit the collection, flamingos, hyenas, chickens, but memory is the real wild beating heart of these poems. And the speaker is, quote, the daughter of remembering and hope. Please welcome Liz Chang. Ooh, thank you so much. OK, sorry, I have to get all my pieces kind of arranged here. Um, all right, start my time so I know where I am. Um, uh, so when, and thank you so much to Moonstone for having us here today, for hosting this uh, contest. Thank you to Grace. I had hoped to meet her, but I completely understand now why she isn't here, right? Nebraska is quite far, right? Um, as I was thinking about coming here today, I, uh, what came to mind was the fact that somebody once told me that they did a study of Olympians' faces when they're standing on the podium, and of course, not surprisingly, the gold medal winner is always the happiest, right? But the second happiest is the bronze medal winner because she's just thrilled to be on the podium. And so that's how I feel today. And thank you so much to George and Aaron as well for sharing this time with me. Um, so the collection is called Animal Nocturne, as Larry mentioned. Um, and it does begin with that poem that Grace called out in her little bit. So I think I will start with that if I can... Come on. I got it. Thank you. I actually, you know, I did all my marks and everything in here. So, um, and you know, I think I'll just jump into the poem and then afterwards talk a little bit about it. So it's called A Herd of Elephants is Sometimes Called a Memory. For A, who once alleged I remember too much of him. If our knowing of each other were an earthly thing, it would be dappled elephant hide, ancient pachyderm skin stretched taut across mud-cured footpads, 
to receive tiny seismic seizures like tender pen taps, calls to rejoin the herd so low they rumble unheard past any human. I know that your marriage is dying. I wish to have language strong enough to carve away the sorrow, to mourn together and so low that only we can hear it. So um, that, that bit about the um, seismic communication they, is, is true, that um, they believe that elephants communicate over long distances, sometimes up to 25 miles, um, by like making these very low rumblings that are outside of uh, the spectrum of human hearing. And the related theory, which I don't think is totally proven, but working theory, right, is that they actually don't hear these sounds, they feel them through their feet, which is so cool, right? <laughs> so, um, so this next poem has a hyena in it, so another animal poem, and it is based off of a true story from my childhood. Um, and you'll see that um, the entire collection is actually dedicated to my daughter, my first daughter. I wrote a lot of, um, of these poems while I was pregnant with her, um, and so I write a lot about um, biracial identity and also kind of through the lens of motherhood. Um, my mother is here today, so <laughs> she is. Yay, thank you for being here. My, I have much of my family, um, friends and family are here today. Um, but in particular, something that I've kind of been grappling with is this idea of, well, not looking like my mother when I was growing up, but as well having a daughter who doesn't so much look like me. Um, she reads as a Caucasian child, right? Um, and so that's something that I've, I've, like I said, I've written about before. Um, and so, like I said, the, the collection is dedicated to her, and then this is this is daughter number two, right? <laughs> in case anybody's wondering as well. Um, and uh, so, but in the poem, you'll hear that I reference, um, unfortunately, when my mother decided to marry my father, she was disinherited initially. And one of the things that her parents said to her was, that she was gonna have mongrel children. And so there is a line in here that references that. Um, but what you should also know, and then I will, I promise I will get to the poem, is um, that before they died, we had very good relationships with them, both myself and my sister and my father eventually. So they were open-minded enough to kind of review their misguided views before they died. So this poem is called Citing the Rare Suburban Hyena. One afterlight car ride in my childhood, we passed a roughened, mangy beast, an apparition loosely draped in dog's clothing. My mother, who was driving and had a better view of the world, declared our specimen hyena. I knew that wasn't right, but she believed, hunted radio news of cavorting zoo animals, circus fugitives, the absence of an easy explanation cooked a marrow-filled bone for storytelling. If I brush the afternoon one way, I see wildness stepping through a clawed tear in our routine, intentional once she, drove, once she chose the path that drove us there, recklessly opposing her parents' proffered name for me, mongrel. That wildness exposed furtive ways of being in the world a mother might not understand, since the miracle of urban coyotes is that they exist at all. If I brush the scene back the other way, the fine hairs of my hackles curl, so much of my youth wrongly christened, and my mother steering, giving name to only her experience. Thank you. So I mentioned this idea of um, biracial identity. In the next poem, I actually wrote while I was pregnant with my daughter, I came across um, an online essay uh, by the um, a woman named Sharon Chang, who is of no relation. There are a lot of Changs in the world. We're not not all directly related. <laughs> um, uh, but she was writing for something called the Hyphen Blog, um, which is associated with a literary magazine. And she um, replicated a conversation that we ha that she had with her four year old son um, about being multiracial. And um, he said apparently, and this is in the epigraph in the poem. Mom, am I white? When I told him no, he immediately followed up with, am I black? When I told him he wasn't, he started crying and told me, but I want a color too. So Aww. this poem is called First Colors. 
Baby, what you are is every color. The best parts of your yellow white mama and her white is really blue and red and green and red and white and red and just red. But we can all agree that that makes white and your orange green plaid daddy. When others ask you what color you are, you may say plaid, orange, green, yellow, white, red, 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 blue, green, white. Or you can just say that you are the star of the plumeria as it yawns open to white, the arcing red ochre green of the stem. You are also the rust of the lichen on sandstone grave markers, the shade of many feet walking across the fecund earth. If your audience still isn't placated, as some will never be, you can say, at night I am the red moon and sky for deserving sailors. By morning I am usually new. In February I am moon pies. Sometimes I am the rare blue moon. Sometimes I am strange even to myself. Mm. And then I have um, kind of embedded in this collection I wouldn't even maybe call it a series, but I over time have been writing a group of very strange love poems to my husband who is here. Yeah, you can't hide behind that glass, right? Okay. And he has not read any of these because he's very trusting, right? And, um, um, and inside the collection, you'll see there's a poem of um, called Fast Food Love, which takes place at a Burger King. There's Love as a Chicken, which is the one that I'm about to read. And then there is Love as a Funeral. So again, the idea is non-traditional love poems. So this one is called Love as a Chicken. Sometimes I envy couples who are mistaken for siblings, but I've found now, love, that if their love is the backyard hen, then ours is the extraordinary Millefleur Belgian barboo, her rust-colored body adorned with the confused faces of epoxied African violets. Our love defies her evolutionary improbability with crested ludicrousness. Although she may startle those expecting the ordinary chicken, once she struts a few steps, they relent, acknowledging her innate pultritude. After some quick staccato bobs of her head, they forget they saw anything at all peculiar, and she can and does return to her scratch work. Mm. as I shuffle papers around. Yep, I found it. Um, so the next piece is kind of what I'm calling the Easter egg of today's reading. Um, I don't know how many people know that in a video game, <laughs> the Easter egg is the thing that if you're in the know, um, you can find it and it kind of opens up this whole new world, right? So this is the only poem in the collection that is themed kind of along these lines. But after this, I'm going to read a short series um, that are not in the collection, and I'll explain why. Um, this poem is called At the Funeral, um, and unfortunately when I was pregnant with my first daughter, I found out um, through Facebook, actually, uh, that one of my childhood friends had been riding her bike in Seattle. She was wearing a helmet and she made a legal left turn and was hit by a truck and killed at the scene. Um, and I mean, besides the fact of losing my friend, the great tragedy of it was that um, she had just gotten married. She had a seven month old daughter sure. and um, and they had bought a house and all of this stuff. But and, and my friend, although she died at 31, made so much good happen in this world. She was actually on the legal team that challenged and eventually reversed Don't Ask, Don't Tell um, before she turned 31. <laughs> um, and so, like I said, her daughter was seven months old when she died and then I attended my friend's funeral when I was seven months pregnant. And so it's something that has resonated with me kind of over time. So this poem is called At the Funeral. Her infant daughter stares, gathering up the scene in her mind as a late season bee collects pollen, reflexively caring and storing. She does not know to yowl for her dead. I want an animal nocturne, a howling choir of loss to mourn my friend, but this mute choreography exposes the depth of her disappearance. 
The stoic silence of this day will be transposed for her child later, much later, when she cannot remember her mother. I carry my daughter inside me. I try not to cry for her, but my body disobeys me. I weep through my ribs in the walled garden in the winter, crushing umber flora underfoot for my friend.